is the time of avaricious men. Uh, everybody, for power, baby. Here they come again. We are and I hope your day has gone well. I was going to say, have you ever had a day like that? And by that I mean a day that just kind of knocks you out. And if you haven't, I have an extra one to spare with you, to share with you. So tonight we've got an interesting show, a very interesting guest, who's done some remarkable research on his own, and along with another investigator, photographer, author. So I will be introducing him in just a little bit. We're going to cover some of the things that are inescapable and unavoidable in the world, seemingly, because people don't want to avoid them, at least the masses don't. Now, that being said, in speaking about a day like this, let me tell you that something came to me in the kind of the late middle of the night. And if you ever wake up like three or four in the morning, you don't know why, and your mind is going a million miles a second. Then maybe something comes to you. You uh, go, oh, yeah, I've got to think about that. Then if you're thinking about things in the late night, we early hours of the morning, it can keep you even more awake. You get all fired up. And at the same time, sometimes, at least for me, I know if I do that or when and while I'm doing that, I'm going to be a little tired for the rest of the day because I'm all energized a little too soon. I have beaten the sun in rising. So strangely enough, after I had run through all these things that were in my mind, a couple of words occurred to me. And perhaps you are familiar with some of the meditations from Billy Meyer. Maybe you do them in German, maybe you do them in English. And they're beautiful, they're fantastic, and they are, they're so effective in terms of focusing and settling the consciousness into a direction, be that one of moving forward and striving or one of coming back to being within, going within. But sometimes I just almost don't even have the energy to do something to relax myself. So I'm lying there and two words came into my mind. And those two words were deep, calm, deep, calm. And I thought about them. And, you know, I, I, I have a process that I do, do standing up where I'm you know, processing certain issues and emotions and events and all. I've taught that workshop for many years. And... What happened was that it brought me into that internal place where I wasn't calm and to not just a place in an etheric sense, but rather the parts of me where it was at my solar plexus or my stomach or, or my back, whatever. And I'm lying there and I'm using that as a little mantra, deep, calm, deep, calm. And it started to resonate inside of me. And it started to relax me and took me to a very interesting and restful place. And during the day, when I when I got up, I, I remembered that, gee, I had an interesting couple of hours of rest here because I'd focused on that little two-word mantra, deep, calm, deep calm. And periodically throughout the day, which was tiring nonetheless, I found myself going back to that whenever I was trying to strive at a time when I knew it wasn't necessary, when that habitual drive was coming up, deep calm was resonating inside me, that phrase. And 
as I let it resonate, it produced its state. And I then, of course, thought about, gosh, the world out there, you know, whatever that means. You flash through the, the headlines and, and look at the stories or don't look and just see how, you know, things are going. And that there's very little calm, deep or otherwise, certainly not very deep in the world, as it's represented to us, as it's sold to us and bombards us through the media, which intends to not promote a deep calm, but to overstimulate anxiety and fear and a quest for escapism and entertainment. Any and everything but deep calm deep calm and i had the occasion to be sitting somewhere where there were very big windows out exposing and inviting a cloud filled almost blue sky the puffy clouds are dancing around and it's just beautiful and it was resonated to me it was embodying em epitomizing an external deep calm that was just all pervasive. I think it's a good idea to find whatever word or words, whatever meditations, certainly Billy has them. Certainly if you have a one or two word or three word thing that you can use to recenter yourself and to allow, you remember we spoke during one of these little programs about letting things go off this way and letting them go off that way so that they don't come in and implode in your psyche in your center but rather it, what why what are we going to have in there we're going to have deep calm and we don't want that to be needlessly disturbed and most of those disturbances are needless we don't need them but they are present so deep calm is what I offer you. Now, there is some news. As usual, endlessly Billy Myers information, prophetic, accurate, fulfills, and the world, whatever that may really be, seems to be sleepy and unaware, in denial, wherever you may offer it. Very few places is it welcomed or accepted, resonated with, responded to, discussed. Maybe your experience is different. Maybe you have uh, more resonance in the, in the world, in your world, when you try to speak about these things. I know from the comments that people make on the blog that a lot of people run into this resistance, this deaf, dumb, and blind consciousness in the world, and from, oftentimes from very nice people, but who know nothing particular about this material and its <laughs> invaluable, invaluable contribution, which will be most realized hundreds of years from now. It's really, as I've said oftentimes, for the survivors, but those of us who are now surviving and thriving whenever possible in deep calm, in the Salome meditation, in our fellowship with each other, etc., we don't have to wait for some future personality of ours to come along who won't remember this, but we'll discover again the Billy Meyer material, the creation energy teaching, the prophecies and predictions. And there will be a lot of lamenting, and as they say in the ancient text, gnashing of teeth as well, because people are going to feel like they were betrayed by those in the past, many among us and other generations, who could have made the difference and turned the direction to that more positive and neutral positive place. So, as some of you know, maybe who read the blog, and I will simply read some of it from it's the short stuff, there's a recent development that paved the way for the further fulfillment of the World War III prophecies and predictions in the Meyer material. And it's an article that was sent to me 
by Donna Ambrose, friend in Hawaii. And she finds, like, like many people do, well, I wish even more were finding this stuff and then realizing, like the people like Donna who send it in, they recognize it. They know that this is happening now. They know that most people don't know. So Donna gets, uh, gets this article, reads it and sends me a link. And it says NATO plans liaison office in Geneva. Now it's on our blog. You can read this where it says, you know, the uh, UFO report show seven. And you will find that NATO is in the process of setting up some kind of an office in Switzerland. And there are some Swiss, to their credit, not a lot, who are going, wait a minute. This is betraying our neutrality. Billy Meyer has written profusely about the Swiss betraying their own neutrality and what's coming from it. And the writing about this and the prophecies actually go back a very long time. So the way it was expressed in another article, there was a couple of articles online. This is a sentence that was uh, referring to this situation. As an independent and neutral country, we should not be a site for defense alliances, said National Council member for the Swiss People's Party, Franz Grutte, chairman of the Foreign Affairs Committee. So Franz still gets it, as do some people who are not yet in the place of going numb and dumb and effectively selling out the Swiss who for hundreds of years survived and thrived very nicely because they did cultivate and maintain their neutrality. We are anything but neutral in this country. We are being sold all sorts of stuff all the time to take partisan positions because there's profit in that for people, not for the people of the country, really, only for those who, well, you know, control things. So there was a prophecy in the Patele prophecies, Patel, Petale prophecies. This one from January 29th, 1976, early in the morning. A couple short sentences. City of conferences in the land of peace, ruined, destroyed. Blazing, brandished in rubble, the treasures lie in the lake, tearing, drifting through the river to the ocean. Could be tearing also because of the way it's spelled. Woe unto you, city of peace conferences in the heart of Europe, servants of idols, mighty ones and cult rulers heap silver and gold on you. Somewhat ominous. And then there was another little prophetic bit in the Henoch prophecies from 1987 originally from about 10,000 years ago, but published first in German in 1987, English about 2002, and in the book, uh, and still they fly, and yet they fly, I think that's where it was. So what we have here is the alleged extraterrestrial Quetzal speaking in, a, I think, a final paragraph in the prophecies, to Billy, because Billy had asked him something about Switzerland, because Billy knows what's coming to Switzerland, but he has to go, well, tell me something that I already know for everybody who doesn't know it, and I'll pretend I don't know it too, which he does all the time. So Quetzal says, in response to Meyer, if Switzerland would really remain neutral, she would be spared any actions of war. Due to much irresponsibility among the people and government, the land of peace, as it was called in early prophecies, will lose its real neutrality, despite different explanations and promises of the irresponsible. Ooh. Indeed, the fact will be that these irresponsible in office will establish contacts to join the UN and NATO, as well as the European Union, which in consequence, cause and effect, not bad, 
will destroy the actual neutrality of Switzerland. In fact, Quetzal says, in referring to the prophecies, contrary to all assertions of the responsible in government and the misled population, as I already explained to you. Through the UN and NATO, Switzerland and her citizens will be drawn into actions of war. Indeed, the nature of the UN should be purely peaceful, yet this will not remain so, for it will be unavoidable that the forces of UN will also take up arms in the new millennium. This may possibly only be for defensive purposes, but this still means actions of war, so death will also reap a rich harvest in the lines of the UN forces. Folks, it's now. So let's delve into some really, really interesting material here and leave behind that which we right now cannot do any more about, certainly in this moment. We're going to, we have the UFO report, right? Well, the UFO report delves into all things Billy Meyer and all things space related and what have you. So tonight, Francisco Vilate is going to join us and he is going to tell us what has gone into, uh, in terms of his research for the uh, report, the video he has online about the Apollo 11 and 13 hoaxes. Now, this of course is controversial, it's become fodder for conspiracy theories, etc. But all of the concerns and theories, conspiratorial or otherwise, seem to be missing any cohesive, conclusive uh, material, substantiating credible links and fabrics and weavings. So let's bring on Francisco Vilate. Are you there, Francisco? Yes, you are. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you for having me, Michael. It's a pleasure. Thank you. <laughs> would you, to start with, would you be so kind as to tell people about you, your work, your background, to whatever degree you want, and then we will jump into the the, uh, the investigation and the videos that you, you've done on this, the video. Okay, thank you, Michael. Uh, yes, um, uh, my name is, uh, as Michael said, Francisco Bigatti. I'm originally from South America, from Colombia. Uh, I used to use a, um, um, an alias name called Ral Sahi. So you may find some of my investigation under the name of Ral Sahi. It was a, a, an alias name that I used before for writing some books. So I started using the same alias name. Uh, right now I'm using my legal name. Uh, it doesn't matter. Actually, this is not really important. Uh, my background very quickly is I am an engineer, civil engineer, with uh, some studies on system engineer. Uh, I did some studies on astronomy and astrophysics, uh, very short specialization for six months. Uh, and I've been uh, amateur astronomers, uh, always dreaming with the stars that you see behind me, the pillars of creation is very nice. Um, I love uh, NASA, all the space travels. Uh, what I'm going to talk today is not blaming NASA. I'm blaming the people that think that uh, projecting that false image of perfection is wrong. We are learning through imperfection as well. So we are learning on our success and also in our failures. Is that very important right now? Because we see a lot of uh, people in governments um, probably starting or maybe already start a, a world, world war, uh, but they pretend to be perfect. They pretend to project that image that everything is fine. Uh, we didn't do anything wrong and we are the good guys. Actually, we are all interconnected. Uh, in that interconnection, we are learning through a process of uh, learning through our mistakes and our success. I'm going to share the, my screen. So right now, uh, tell me, Michael, if you can see it. 
Uh, we're waiting for that to occur. Okay, let me. Are you seeing it? Let me let me try again. Uh, okay. Okay, maybe it is coming. There right? we go. Okay. Yes, indeed. So this is a short presentation. Um, I do not pretend to show everything that is already in the documentary. I invite you to look at that. Uh, but the, my first comment is why I am working on the evidence. I know for some people it's not a really exciting topic. Maybe there are other topics related with uh, Billy Mayer that are more profound, more interested. Uh, but I always try to find a learning on everything that is happening, especially on historical uh, aspects uh, or situations that have been happening uh, in our society. So the learning here is, as I told you, is that uh, that idea of uh, projecting perfection. So the saints, the politicians, everybody is perfect. So it end up with a lot of problems. And this is one of a case around that because of projecting a political image of perfection that they do not fail uh, because uh, probably somebody was scared to fail in on the Apollo mission. They conducted two hoaxes that I think were not really required. As I said, I don't think the NASA as an entity is uh, um, creating this uh, uh, deception. It's just a group of people, maybe uh, forced or somehow uh, put into this situation by uh, Richard Nixon, the ex-president of the United States. So let, let's start to see that. Okay, so you can see the full documentary if you haven't done so. Uh, you find the link in the Michael Horn's uh, blog in dayflyblog.com. It's the Apollo 11 and 13 hoaxes. Uh, what is this about? Uh, Billy Mayer that is been in contact with extraterrestrial Pleiadian, as he claims, he talks about two interesting facts. Actually, I feel that uh, Pat, the guy on the right side, uh, don't want to talk about any more about that. He's tired about that. Uh, imagine some ETs uh, flying in a spaceship and knowing that Apollo 11 never landed and everybody on Earth just imagine that it happened. So they, they feel some frustration that we are so naive and in some cases that we are forced by some people uh, uh, to go into some kind of deception or fabrication. The, so they told us that the Apollo 11 never landed on the moon. Uh, they don't give a specific details. Uh, they only said that they record everything and transmit the recording from to the Houston Space Center. They also tell us that the second hoax is the Apollo 13. They said that uh, there was not a technical fa failure. We know that they call Houston, saying, Houston, we have a problem. Actually, they didn't have a problem. Uh, I think that when they call and say that, they were on, already on the surface on the moon. All right, and also uh, they tell us about the mission that are succe successful. So maybe is, this is a bad news for the people that like the, like the conspiracy theories that saying that the NASA has never been on the moon. Yes, they have been there and it's a great, great achievement by the very uh, great people in working in scientists, engineering and everything there this is one success uh, apollo 12 to apollo 17 were successful so that means apollo 12 was the first uh, uh, mission from apollo that actually land on on the on the moon uh, michael if you have any question you can interrupt me at any time okay that's okay. fine i think we're gonna enjoy this go 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 <laughs> okay uh, okay were the Apollo 11 photos and video taken in a studio? Uh, not really. I mean, the, the, there were some videos that were transmitted to Houston, but all the videos, almost all of them that you see right now, all the photos that you see are from the moon. You say, what? 
So what is the hoax here? I'm going to explain you in detail. Some people have been looking at, for example, that the, we don't see stars on the photos. And this is very normal because the moon is very bright uh, and the eye of the people, uh, the pupil is, uh, gets very small because there is a lot of light around. Also the camera diaphragm, diaphragm is uh, very small, uh, very narrow. So it's not possible to see the stars there. Too much light around. Uh, imagine that there is not atmosphere. Probably the light there is as bright as being in the middle of the, the Sahara Desert on a place like that uh, by noon. So it's very bright. Um, I, as an amateur astronomer, know that uh, when I'm going to watch the stars, if I, for example, inside a, a house and I know outside is an, at night, is a beautiful starry night, is dark sky, so I can go outside and, and watch the stars. As soon as I go outside, because I was in, inside, indoors, and there was a lot of light, I see nothing. I don't see any stars. I have to wait some time until, because of the darkness, my pupil of, of my eyes gets bigger and I can see the stars. It's the same case here. So it's not possible to see the stars but because there is a lot of light around. So that's very common. Uh, other people said that the flag is fake because they see the movement and they say there is no atmosphere, not air on the moon. So it's not possible that when the astronauts are setting up the flag, the flag moves like this, like this way, it's just waving in the way that it does. They say there is not air, so it's not possible. But they forget that there is another force. It's not only the pressure of air. The other force is called inertia. Inertia, Inertial uh, forces that uh, try to keep the things where they are. So if we move something, uh, the movement is uh, slow. So there is some kind of uh, slow movement of the flag, some waving that is normal. So yes, the flag is, is, is fine. Other people said that uh, the flag should be down because there is uh, some gravity on the moon, but actually there is a horizontal pole on the flag that keep it in the position that we see here on the figure. Other people said that there are multiple lights and this is an studio because you see the shadows that are not parallel, but they forget that the shadows follow a perspective law that they even though they are parallel, that goes to the infinity in a point that is in the infinity. All of them are of the ray from the sun and also the shadows point to that uh, uh, little uh, node or point uh, on the horizon. So this is normal. So this is not uh, a real uh, evidence of fraud of anything like that. Uh, other people, and that's very funny, they said because there's no wind in on the moon, because there is not air, so if the astronaut walks, they, they, we, cannot, we should not see uh, sand uh, being thrown by the bo boats of the, of the um, astronauts. And this is not correct, uh, because the astronauts, while, while they are working, if they hit a little piece of sand on the floor, the sun just falls very far away. Actually, this is a proof that these videos showing the astronauts and hitting the soil and projecting sun and gravel far away is an evidence that this is on the moon. On Earth, it's not possible to do it. I challenge you to go to the beach or some place where there's some sun and walk and see if you hit some uh, little bump of sand and you can send it probably two or three meters away from you because the air do not uh, uh, let you do that. In the moon, because of low gravity, they fall very far away. So this is an indication that these uh, uh, videos are, have been taken on the moon. 
Okay, but uh, are they taken on the Apollo 11 moon, uh, moon mission? Uh, not really. So it's not the Apollo 11, it was taken on the Apollo 13. Actually, there are two pieces of evidence. One of them is one of the videos that I see, I feel, or I, uh, I am stating that this is fake. Is the first part of the video that we see uh, Armstrong and Aldrin stepping down from the uh, lunar module. So you see the horizon is not flat. Other photographs on the moon, you see there is a flat horizon, but here you see there is a slope. Also the lunar module is somehow tilted, is on the slope. And the NASA says in some of the articles that it's because the camera that was attached to the uh, lunar module was uh, tilted. So there was an inclination, you say like that, so some kind of uh, deviation from the horizontal line. This is not true because you see the astronauts walking vertically and that arrows is not perpendicular to the horizontal lines. So the vertical line is in the direction of the arrows, but the horizon is clearly in a slope. Uh, you see all of the photographs of most of them, well, all of the photographs and most of the videos had been replaced by the one taken on Apollo 13. Why they did not replace this one? Because they could have um, Apollo 13 a video, a good one, uh, with some astronauts, not exactly Aldrin and Armstrong, but the Apollo 13 astronauts, stepping down to the uh, moon surface, and they could replay that. Why? I imagine that maybe they don't have a good shot. Maybe the clip uh, on that uh, event of stepping down to the lunar surface was not very good. So that one, is still there. This is, I think, the only clip that is from the original uh, tele telemetry transmission from, from the moon. Uh, there's also another aspect that I will be talking in more detail. As, uh, even though the Apollo 13 tried to reach the moon as soon as possible in order to have the right position of the sun, they didn't accomplish it. The sun the sun is too high in the photographs. And that's a very important topic that I will be cover, covering. Okay, so the, the recording studio, this, this film is in the recording studio, and this photograph is taken in Apollo 13, not in Apollo 11. Okay, very quickly, some events uh, for Apollo 11 uh, that uh, took place in July 1969. Uh, so there were some fields recorded in a training facility, a training site. Uh, we find in the NASA site uh, photographs of this training site. You see uh, there is a replica of the moon surface. There is a replica uh, of the lunar module. Uh, and why, why they have that one? Well, they also have some simulators for simulating space uh, operations like landing on the moon, like taking off or conducting any kind of activity on the spacecrafts. So they have also a training facility, so they have to plan everything that has to be done. They cannot go to the moon and improvise to do things uh, without training before. So there is a training site. And in order to uh, simulate the low gravity, they uh, hang the astronaut with some cables so that pull them upwards with those cables that it gives the impression that they are, uh, the weight is less and they have to walk by jumping on the moon. So this is that it was done there. So they recorded uh, all the mission. It was around two hours of all the equipment installation, maybe less than that. And they take it, the astronaut take, take this recording to the moon. Why they went to the moon? Because it's only 37 people that were part of this uh, hoax, uh, that this fabrication. Uh, 
So a lot of people were involved. You mean, uh, I mean, there were some people that are with the astronaut, uh, helping them to get into the uh, rocket before takeoff or um, uh, going up to the space. Other um, people from the Marine, probably militars in helicopters, receiving them when they splashed on the ocean. Uh, and also they were sending the transmission from the, the recorder field. They were sending the telemetry information or the transmission from the moon because uh, the earth is rotating. So it's not possible that Houston could be uh, receiving all the transmission all the time, 24 hours a day, and it was receiving the collaboration of other uh, satellite reception facilities around the world. So it, they, they have to go there. What they did, they traveled in, uh, in the Apollo mission, Apollo 11 mission, and they conducted exactly the same as they did in the Apollo 10. The Apollo 10 went to the moon with the astronauts, get very close, got very close to the moon, but never landed. But I think uh, most probably Nixon or somebody was very nervous about the possibility that they will fail. They were thinking that probably the lunar module were not able to land um, um, successfully. There was a risk that the, uh, they crashed the moon uh, module or the moon module would just uh, flip over. So it will be uh, killing the astronaut on, on the moon. So they considered this as a risk. And maybe I, I think that they do not want to run that risk because they have to project that image of perfection that they did it and they were successful. So what they did was exactly going to the moon and following the same uh, routine of the Apollo 10, but not landing on the moon. So the famous phrase that uh, Neil Astrum said about one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind, he was telling that when he was in orbit of the moon. Maybe he was, he, he were, or they were transmitting the recordings from the moon as is, he was on the moon, walking on the moon, but he was not walking on the moon. And also the astronauts were talking live with Richard Nixon, and they were talking live with uh, some of the operators in the Houston Center. So it's not possible to have a recording conversation. So the conversation was live from the moon, but they sent the, the recordings uh, that they were on the moon that actually didn't happen, and they sent it from the capsule. When they returned, they, as Billy said, they were brainwashed. Uh, they were into hypnot hypnosis, hypnosis sessions uh, with the use of drugs. So in their minds, they remember that they, they were walking on the moon even though that probably they only did it on the training facility. So it's very hard to, to receive a, a confession from them telling that they never walk on the moon because they don't know it. They, there's a false memory implanted in their brains. Actually, the only astronaut that is alive, I think, is Aldrin. I'm not sure about Collins. But um, Neil Astron is already, has already passed away. Uh, something that is very funny is that after the arrival, Richard Nixon promoted them to go around the world in a, in a tour visiting uh, 24 countries and in 29 cities in these countries. That tour lasts for 30 days, 30, 38 days, uh, um, more than one month, and they were given some space rocks. Uh, actually, in Bogota, I saw one of the space rocks in the planetarium. It's a little one that looks like a meteorite. Probably it's a, a, a meteorite, not a, moon, a, a rock from the moon. Something very curious is that recently, 
uh, one of these uh, moon rocks in, in the Netherlands, in a, a national museum, that they were sure that it was from the moon because they received it from the astronauts. Um, and finally arrived to the museum, they noticed that it was a petrified tree. So it was a fossil, not a moon rock. So that was fake. And it would be very interesting to see if all the rocks that they gave in this tour were fake. Because the, the tour that the astronauts uh, of the Apollo 11 mission did was uh, before the Apollo 12. After Apollo 12, NASA had some rocks. And after Apollo 13, they have rocks from the uh, area of the Apollo 11. So probably they replaced the fake ones. Apollo 12 was the first one landing. So they collected some rocks. Um, it was a successful mission, and this was the first one. After this uh, event, uh, NASA or the people that conduct the, the, the hoax were feeling more comfortable, and they, know, they knew that now it was possible to land on the moon. It was not as difficult as they were thinking on the Apollo 11. So they conduct the second hoax, that was Apollo 13, and they travel very quickly to the moon. If you go to the NASA website, you find that it says that the Apollo 13 flight with uh, extra fuel because they want to test uh, the rocket with, uh, with uh, even though they don't have a full capacity, they don't have a rover that will be taken to the moon later on, but they want to have more fuel because they want to do some tests. Actually, I think they have more fuel because they want to arrive to the moon very quickly in a very quick operation, as uh, Billy Mayer says. So they land on the moon and they were installing all the Apollo instruments. And at some point of the time, they call Houston and says that they have a problem. Houston, we have a problem. Probably they said that when they were on the moon surface. surface. They took photos and videos in the Sea of Tranquility, that is the Apollo 11 site. They then returned and were also brainwashed with, by hypnosis, so they have fake memories. Uh, my intuition tells me that the, the, the process that was uh, of the brainwashing that was conducted on Apollo 13 was not so strong as the Apollo 11, because the Apollo 11, they were in a, a quarantine for two weeks, they were isolated from everybody. Apollo 13, they didn't have that quarantine. And maybe this is not uh, as risky to know, uh, or they remember everything, but probably their uh, brainwashing, brainwashed, uh, um, activity that was conducted to them was not uh, as strong as strong as the Apollo 11. Uh, in 2005, some um, um, ex-workers uh, on NASA and other people interested, they asked for uh, look at the original telemetry from the Apollo, the one that was transmitted from the moon. Oh, that's very curious. Disappear. 14 rolls of uh, magnetic tape uh, never appears. Uh, can you imagine that NASA lost that piece of information of the first landing on the moon? Uh, so it's not possible to see right now and compare these uh, videos that were transmitted from the moon with the videos that we have right now that are from the Apollo 13, because what we have right now is from the Apollo 13. Uh, so all the photos that we see today that NASA published as are from the Apollo 11, and without knowing that, they are most probably from Apollo 13, not from Apollo 11. Uh, so the, the big question is, how can we prove these hoaxes? If you read, you read Billy Major contact notes, uh, you see that he said that probably it's impossible to prove it in the future. Probably it will be never proved. So imagine how can somebody just find out that there it was all a hoax. 
is um, probably the astronaut will pass away or die in the future. And if somebody goes there and uh, check every mark on the, on the soil and check everything that is there and compare with the videos and the photos, we'll find that are exactly the same. So it matches perfect, perfectly with, uh, with that. I see that somebody said that probably the way to find out that it was a hoax is for future mission to go there and verify every little rock, every footprints, the location of the equipment and compare with the photos. It will not help at all because it's exactly the same because it was put there uh, by Apollo 13 and the photos are from Apollo 13 not from Apollo 11. Uh, and if we find out that all the rocks that the astronauts, uh, Armstrong and Aldrin, gave uh, during their tour around the world, all these rocks are fake, um, it's also not, not proving the, 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 the theory that it was a hoax. Because somebody could say, OK, there was a guy in the NASA that is not working with us. Maybe he's already passed away that he was very jealous to give all the rocks, so he sent fake uh, rocks. I'm sorry about that, but we have good ones, so let me replace the one that you have that is fake with the real rocks. So it really didn't prove, so keep us suspicious, uh, make us suspicious, but it's not really a proof. So all the people that are uh, looking at these conspiracy theories and try to find proof that this was done, this photograph was done in a studio, uh, they would never achieve that because they are not in a studio. This is not a studio of the type of uh, Stanley Kubrick movie because this is actually on the moon by Apollo 13. So maybe it's impossible to check the or verify it was a hoax or maybe there is one way to do it, and I will present that today. Okay, um, this is the moon map. Uh, you see the Apollo 11 on the top uh, image. You see the moon, and you see Apollo 11, supposed to land on the uh, Sea of Tranquility, at the Mare Tranquilitatis. Um, in that area that is flat, and there, and Apollo 12, you see where it is uh, landed, and the Apollo 13, where it has to land it. Some years ago, when I heard from Billy saying that Apollo 13 put all the equipment uh, in the Apollo 11 landing, so I look at that at this figure on the middle, and I said, okay, if they, instead of going to the Apollo 13 site, they went to the Sea of Tranquility, the sun will be in a higher position. So it's not possible to take pictures and video there uh, imitating the one from Apollo 13. Ah, but what happened if the Apollo 13 fly faster? So if it can go really fast to the moon and land uh, very quickly, uh, not in the uh, normal uh, speed that was planned for Apollo 13, original plan. So in that way, they arrived earlier. So the original plan for Apollo 13 was to arrive in or landing on April 16 of 1970. Actually, I think they landed on uh, April 13, 13, 1970. So three days before. So the sun was in a good position. In the moon, imagine there is a line that is called the terminator. It's the line that divides the, the day and the night on the moon's surface. If you are in the terminator, you see the sun on the horizon, uh, starting to rise in from the horizon slowly. There is much more slowly than on air because the air rotation is around 29 days. It's not 24 hours that on Earth. Uh, if you go, for example, in the in that area uh, on the right side, you you will be you see the sun on the top of you. So depending on the location, 
they see the sun in a different position. Okay, so what's the elevation on the photographs? So I was doing some checks. Uh, this is one of the photos. I've been analyzing around 10 different photos. Uh, so I checked the, the elevation of an instrument, <coughs> excuse me, and, <coughs> and the length of the, of the shadow on the ground. So it's very simple. Uh, if you uh, look at the, this elevation and you divide it by the length of the shadow, this is the tangent. Uh, I'm talking about trigonometry, the tangent of the angle. So you may know the angle. So it's a basic trigonometric relation. So you can know the angle just by measuring the elevation and the length of the, of the shadow. Uh, the position has to be almost in front view. Doesn't help when is, you see that the, uh, the shadow is projected uh, far away. Has to be projected from right to left or from left to right. In that case, I found is 21 degrees. In another cases, I found here is uh, 20 degrees. Here with the flag, I found is uh, 22 degrees. In this uh, piece of equipment that is smaller, is 18 degrees. Is in average is around 20 degrees. Okay. Now the question is how high the sun was there. Uh, so what do you think? How can we do it? So the way to do it is by using a NASA tool uh, from the Jet Propulsion Laboratory that is in internet. It's called Horizon. Horizon's tool gives you the opportunity to check that. So you decide, for example, you select the observer location. The observer location is the landing site for the Apollo 11. Uh, the body that we are looking at is the sun. So, and you put the dates and you say it on the table setting, you said, I want to see the elevation of the sun. So I receive, I have that information that I confirm with other uh, pages in the, in the NASA uh, about the elevation of the sun. Uh, the sun was around 11 degrees when they arrived. When Astrom did the first step on the moon was 14 degrees. And when they came back to the lunar module were 15 degrees. So around 14 degrees, uh, no more than 15 degrees of elevation above the horizon, uh, they saw the sun. So 15 degrees, why I see here 20 degrees? It's too high, right? Why that difference? For 20 degrees, should be here when they were ready to return in to the space from the moon. Uh, in, when they land, uh, they, uh, they initially put the space suit. They extract all the oxygen that was on the cabin. So they empty all the air inside there with the space suit. They went down. So it took some time to do that, reducing the pressure on the cabin. And then they walk for around two to three hours, installing all the equipment, and they came back. Then they never go outside again. Why? Because it, it, is, it causes a lot of oxygen, loss of oxygen every time you decompress the cabin and you compress it again with oxygen. So they did only one uh, walk on the moon and one period. When they returned it, they closed the door and it took some hours to reach the pressure, the normal pressure of the cabin. And they put out their astronaut uh, suits and they sleep for five hours. And after that, they take off from the moon surface and return to space to meet uh, Collins that was uh, orbiting, uh, doing some orbits around the moon. So 20 degrees is around the time when they were returning. So it's not possible to see Apollo 11 photographs with 20 degrees elevation. It's impossible. So something is wrong here, right? Okay, so what happened is I, well, uh, there's other photographs because when you measure the horizontal distance, you are not sure that the terrain is flat and there is a lot of little rocks, so it's not completely flat. So there are some errors. So I did another calculation 
This is a nice photograph that you see these bright objects on the top left corner. This is caused by uh, uh, um, a lens flare effect. Uh, Michael, I want to check the time. How are we doing on time? Well, uh, Francisco, this is this is fascinating. We we probably have about four. Well, now we have about a minute left. I think no, four minutes. Are you able okay. to? Uh... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's finish very quickly. Uh, it, I, I'm asking that because of that. Okay. So basically, with the lens flares of projecting the lines, I found that the elevation of the sun in this case is 22 degrees and you see here is 11 degrees only so why that difference so that means instead of seeing let's say if you go outside and see the sun at 8 a.m but you see it that is a uh, higher like uh, 9 a.m in the morning so there's a difference here is another one and you see the same thing so basically what i found is that uh, in order to do that in Apollo 13, they have to arrive very quickly, probably in two days, uh, forcing the engines, arriving very quickly, uh, installing all the equipment, and it, it is possible around, they arrive at this time, uh, on April 13, around 5 p.m. universal time. Okay, so the conclusion is that the photograph show at elevation that is 20 degrees, in some cases up to 24 degrees. So it's uh, only uh, 15 degrees or 40, 14 degrees on the Apollo 11. So it's not possible that it's been taken on the moon. So I am inviting right now uh, any NASA engineer, any engineer, any astronomer, anybody that have the ability to check the elevation of the uh, sun in the photographs, and check my findings. So it's some kind of peer review, but I'm finding that it's 20 degrees, so it's not possible that the Apollo 11 took this photo. They are from Apollo th uh, 13. So this is a proof that it was a hoax. We don't have to wait until we have a better spacecraft to go there and check everything. We know that right now. Okay, that's it, Michael. <laughs> Fantastic, fantastic. Thank you, Francisco. This is, well, you know, I've watched the video and you brought uh, much more information in terms of presenting it live in a person for us and with a PowerPoint. And I am not somebody that is highly knowledgeable at all about the kind of discrete science that has gone into your analysis and presentation. But I think that the very almost last thing you said about inviting NASA people to participate and to uh, in, engage with this. I think this video should be sent widely to all sorts of universities <laughs> and scientists, even knowing in advance. I, I imagine that, nature. Michael. Yes, I know you. Yeah. yeah, you know the nature of the beast, and yeah. you know what I'm going to say, but fantastic work. No, I, I it, truly... is, it, it is a peer review. Uh, somebody show me if the elevation is 15 degrees and show me how they calculate that. And we can have a discussion uh -huh. around that. But it's 20 degrees. It's not Apollo 11. That's a fact. Yeah. Okay. I love it. I, I mean, you, you make this sensible. And so it is not dripping with conspiratorial stuff. So um, Francisco Viate, I, I thank you so much for coming and uh, presenting and please people uh, it, the video is online it is linked through my blog you'll find it on youtube and uh, for those of you who are truly scientifically minded uh, take a, take a run at it and engage with francisco and let's see if maybe a little light gets sh shown on the the truth here it's exciting to see something like this so again thank you for being here i'm going to uh, invite uh, the listeners to make their comments as usual. And we will be back next week. I'm not quite sure what we're going to do next Tuesday night, because this is this is a great one. We keep getting great presentations, you know, from, from everybody. So thank you again. And to everybody out there in, uh, well, in, in the earthly realm, contemplate and see what it means to you to engage in the contemplation of deep calm, deep Come. So be safe and be serene and salome to everybody. We will be back 
next week. And thank you, Don and BBS for this opportunity. Good night. <laughs>